So let's look at the evolution of the animals. And the first animals that evolved coming from you know, some ancestral protist had no true tissues. They looked something more like what we in modern day sponges. But eventually tissues were evolved. And then you had two types of body forms. Radial symmetry is seen in the cnidarians and the bilateral symmetry seen in the rest of the animal life. So when you look at bilateral symmetry, this is when you can take an organism and divide it into two halves, a left and a right side. Whereas radial symmetry is more like a pie where you can cut it into multiple planes that are all equivalent. So what we're going to do is just work our way down this tree. We already just talked about sponges. They're very simple organisms and now we'll look at cnidarians. Cnidarians are the corals, sea anemones, hydras, and jellyfish. And they have a very simple body form with basically an outer covering, an inner covering, and, and, and they bring the food on the inside to eat them. Next, we're going to look at the flatworms. This is probably the next type of organism. Some of the original organisms that were bilaterally sim symmetrical look something like flatworms. And so of the flatworms that are still alive today, this is the phylum platyhelminthes. Um, they have a very simple uh, digestive tract that ends in a blind cavity. So there's a mouth but no anus. Um, they have simple sensory um, organs like, like these simple eyes here. Or many of them are parasitic like the flukes and the tapeworms. Then we're going to look at the mollusks. And the mollusks uh, can be divided into some main groups like the gastropods, snails, and sea slugs. The bivalves, or which are all of the hinged shells, organisms like scallops and other bivalves, and then the cephalopods, octopus and squid and so forth. And these are the different groups of mollusks. Related to the mollusks and the flatworms are organisms like annelids. So annelids are the obviously the things like earthworms that you may be familiar with, but also they um, incorporate organisms like the polychaetes or the so-called Christmas tree worms, and these, these are entirely marine worms, and also leeches. Then we come down to this next um, group of organisms down here and that contain the roundworms and arthropods. And we'll first just look real quickly at the roundworms. Roundworms are, belong to the phylum Nematoda. They're very uh, simple organisms, cylindrical in shape, tapered at both ends, and they basically have a mouth and an anus, and that's the end. And uh, they um, are important for decomposing, so they're found very plentiful out just in the ground, but they're also um, dangerous parasites for both plants, humans, and lots of other animals. A few different kind of gross pictures here. Here's an intestinal, an intestine that's full of a bunch of roundworms. Um, closely related to the roundworms are the arthropods. Uh, they both contain, they both have exoskeletons that they need to shed when they need to get bigger. They're called the ecdysosome. So that's where they're closely related to each other. And of course, you're familiar with many um, arthropods like the arachnids, crustaceans, millipedes, and centipedes, and insects. Within the arachnids, though, there's not just spiders. We're also talking about things like scorpions, mites, and ticks. In the, ins in the crustaceans, it's the obvious things like crabs and shrimps, but also some things that may not be so obvious that are crustaceans, like pill bugs, many or these roly polies. Many people sometimes think these are insects. They're not actually. They're crustaceans that have invaded lands and become, ter um, become terrestrial. And then barnacles, which look a lot more like a bivalve, uh, like a mollusk, but it's actually a crustacean. And these are the, the modified limbs that are sticking out and filter feed. Then of course we have the millipedes and centipedes. Uh, millipedes always have two legs per body segment. Centipedes only have one pair of legs per body segment and their first pair of legs have been modified into these um, jaws and they have venom glands at the base of these jaws. So some of these centipedes that live in you know, uh, tropical areas can be quite dangerous and quite, uh, quite amazing predators. They can take down mice and birds and, and uh, other small reptiles. Then you have the insects, and of course, as an entomologist, this is my favorite group. Uh, arthropods as a whole are the most diverse group of organisms on the planet. We have about a million described arthropods, but that's because they contain the insects. We have about uh, 800,000 to 900,000 described insects uh, right now on the planet, with many, many more that, that need to be described and, and many, many 
um, millions as well that have already gone extinct. But these are just some examples of some of the insects that we have. And then we come down to the next kind of major, major lineage within the animals that are bilaterally sym symmetrical. And we have the echinoderms. You may look at me and say, well, that's not bilateral symmetrical. It looks more uh, like radial symmetry. But it turns out that echinoderms in their uh, larval forms actually are um, have right and left right and left halves, and then they become they have kind of this more radial symmetry when they when they become the adult form. And so this has things like sea urchins, sand dollars, sea cucumbers, and the sea stars. And then that leads us to the chordates, which is another large um, um, and well diversified lineage that we're going to look at, which is the lineage that we belong to. Chordates then are those that ha that begin to have a backbone. So if we look at the ancestral chordate, it probably was something that in its adult form did not have a backbone, and we'll look at this in just a moment like the tunicates, but then eventually this le led to some simple um, indications of what becomes a backbone, a notochord, and then eventually you know, you come down into the fishes, amphibians, reptiles, and mammals where you now have um, the vertebrates because you now have a backbone. So the tunicates, or the sea squirts, this is the adult version of it. It basically has an in-current and an ex-current in their filter feeders. But as larvae, they actually are free swimming and they look a lot like this lancelet here. So they were, they looked, um, they were swimming and they had a, an ancestral notochord and then that notochord degrades away. And you don't see it in the adults. So then lancelets though, apparently, or the, the descendants of the tunicate form, um, probably went some through from went through a pedomorphic event. So the organism as an ancestral or as the immature form became mature while still in the juvenile body which looked more like this swimming kind of uh, a little eel type fish here and that then led to, um, a di to the evolution um, down the road to the chordates, to more and more chordates. So then you get things like hagfishes and lampreys. Eventually the evolution of cartilaginous fish come around like sharks and, and rays and then eventually the bony fish. Um, then you get organisms that start to live part of their life in the water and part of their life outside of the water, the amphibians. And these organisms go through a drastic uh, metamorphosis. So you go from a tadpole to an adult frog or from a newt to a salamander. How this occurred, we actually have a really good explanation and there's some uh, good videos that I'm going to post as well. But you can look at um, basically what happened is you had a fish that evolved to have uh, its fins basically turn into the, um, the legs, right, and the appendages here. And this is where you get the evolution of what's called tetrapody, or four limbs. And so you, this leads to things like crocodiles and dinosaurs and lizards and turtles and birds as well. Um, now snakes, of course, lost their legs secondarily, but ancestrally snakes did have legs. In fact, some snakes you can go into and still see the vestigial uh, organ, the vestigial structures of a hind limb. Then eventually you get the evolution of the mammals. They arose about 200 million years ago. Most mammals are terrestrial, although secondarily dolphins and whales have now become fully aquatic. There are um, three major groups of, of mammals, the monotremes, marsupials, and then the true placental mammals. So the monotremes, these are mammals that still are hatched from an egg. So here is an echidna egg. Uh, the other example of a monotreme is the platypus. The marsupials are are embryonic at birth, so they're not hatched from an egg, but they're so small that they need to climb up into the pouch and then they basically latch on to a teat and continue to grow until they become uh, large enough to fend for themselves. And then you have the true placental mammals that are fully developed at birth, and so they're, once they're birthed they need to very quickly be able to stand up and do what they need to do, at least in most organisms, right? Humans are the one kind of weird example where we must take care of our, ch our children for many years until they're able to fend for themselves. So um, 
Mammals uh, have this huge diversification. We're not going to look at all of the different mammals, but one, the one lineage that does interest us is the primate lineage because we belong to this lineage. And so there's been a huge diversification of primates. Um, the original ones looked more like the lemurs and lorises, and then you get things like the New World monkeys that have tails. Eventually you come to the Old World monkeys and you get the loss of the tail, and you have now the great apes, which includes the orangutans, gorillas, chimpanzees, and humans.